So thank you for the invitation. Uh, nice to be here. Um, so I am a psychiatrist, and I went for the sexy title, the Future of Psychiatry. Um, that's pretty ambitious. Uh, so obviously, I don't know what the future of psychiatry is. Nobody does. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is more, more modestly, my hopes in some aspects of what the future of psychiatry can hold for us. I will be uh, structuring my talk like this. Very simply, I'd like to ground my talk in the story of a patient I know, who I would call David. Before looking forward, I will briefly look back with uh, select elements of the history of psychiatry, some numbers about where we are now uh, in the mental health domain, and then getting into these hopes for the future. David is a fictitious name. For a patient, you will soon understand why it wants to remain anonymous. I met David um, a number of years ago when he was first hospitalized in our young adult ward for a psychotic episode. Psychosis can be a very debilitating, uh, disruptive mental illness, very severe. This was the case for David, who was hospitalized against his will, like many patients in his case. Like many patients uh, in his case, the disease started about one year before he was hospitalized, and unfortunately, he couldn't or didn't access any he mental health care. Also, like many patients in his situation, it took some time to stabilize his situation, about a year, uh, because it was difficult for him to remain engaged in the health care system. Uh, he would miss appointments. He wouldn't always stay engaged in treatments we recommended, but nevertheless, we considered him a pretty good evolution. After one year, he had vastly improved. His symptoms had stabilized. He got a job, which he had lost. He got a very nice girlfriend. He got a flat. Um, and we were pretty happy to see him leave our program uh, to continue treatment with a private therapist. Uh, one notable aspect is that he was sufficiently optimistic about the treatment he has received that he agreed to do an interview uh, for about our program. Uh, we put it up on our website where he explained uh, personally what he had gotten from the program. And he hoped that this would help other patients in his situation better engage in the kind of treatment programs we had. I didn't have news about David for several years after that. Unfortunately, when I did, they weren't that good. Uh, he had some tough breaks in life. Uh, he hadn't always engaged with his therapist, and he relapsed quite severely and was rehospitalized. When I saw him at that time, I was struck by a request he made. He asked me to remove his interview from the website. He explained to me that it turned out it had been quite a problem for him. People had mentioned seeing him on the website and understood he was mentally ill and saw that quite negatively. And it had caused for him problems getting jobs and had possibly contributed to his relapse. So I think David illustrates um, challenges individuals with mental illness have today. And I'll get back to him uh, throughout the talk. I enjoy the history of psychiatry. I think there's a lot to learn from it. Today we have uh, time constraints, so um, apologies to any real historians in the audience. I'm going to give you a three-minute crash course in the history of psychiatry, uh, focused on topics I think are relevant to what I'm going to be talking about. So I hope you're ready. Always nice to start history lessons with Egyptians, and I can. So one of the first references to mental illness is in very ancient, over three millennia, uh, Egyptian medical records describing conditions very similar to what we would now call clinical depression. So that's to start someone. I think it illustrates that mental illness has been with humanity for a very, very long time. What evolves over time is our understanding of mental illness and how we can treat it. Flash forward to the last few centuries. In particular, to note that it's about been now two centuries that we even have the term psychiatry, uh, coined by a German physician in the early 19th century. Johann Rahe was among a group of doctors who were starting to see mental illness 
as something that could be treated medically, hence this new term. Previous to that, mental illness was often seen as a problem, a danger, and the mentally ill were often relegated to hospitals as asylums where they wouldn't bother. For example, the Pitié Salpêtrière in Paris, which was specifically created for prostitutes and the mentally affected, which gives you an idea of sort of the ideas that were there and held about the mentally ill. Treatment was usually chains or contention or coercion. When the straitjacket was invented in 1770, it was seen as a more humane form of treating the mentally ill. Another reference point is 1793, Philippe Pinel, a French physician, who was famous for ordering the chains to be removed from the mentally ill in a parapsychiatric hospital. These ideas would set sort of a new understanding of mental illness. Unfortunately, they took quite some time to be integrated and I would argue are still taking time to be fully integrated. Especially looking at a mental health law how societies govern the use of mental health care and how they see the mentally ill. For example, the Lunacy Act in the United Kingdom in 1845 focused exclusively on giving physicians rights to commit the mentally ill to asylums, with no focus on the rights of the mentally ill or their access to treatment. That would require almost a century later the Mental Health Care Act in 1959 or the Mental Health Parity Act in the USA which would, these are not that long ago, focus more on patients' rights and the equity between mental health and physical health. I won't go into some of the uh, therapeutic milestones here. Just two more things. In the 1950s and 1960s, another medical movement uh, took ground, which was the idea of moving mental health care out of the hospitals into the community. This was specifically uh, championed by the health minister in the UK in 1961, who was one of the first major political speeches to encourage this. We're still working on that. Another important aspect, <coughs> in 2002, uh, in Japan, taking into note something that they were very aware of, the stigma associated simply with the name, mm. schizophrenia. It's just a name for a mental disorder, for a diagnosis. From a mental health perspective, they chose to change the name. I'm not going to humiliate myself by trying to pronounce the Japanese names to integrative disorder and look into this. This simple change, just of a word, changed how patients in Japan accept this diagnosis and engage in mental health care. So just for these sort of uh, reference points in history, where are we now? Very simply, how big of a problem is mental illness, mental health? Um, population surveys are striking. It's very frequent. Over the world population, two out of three individuals at one point will suffer from mental illness, diagnosable mental illness. Even looking over a period of just one year, it's one in five. In this room, one out of five of us over the next year will develop a mental illness. Look around you. If it's not you, it's someone right next to you. Seeing this room actually, and I can talk about this later if wanted, that proportion is probably a bit higher than one in five. So it's very frequent. Obviously, not all of these mental illnesses are as severe as what I described for David but they are diseases that can be treated, that cause suffering, and that cause dysfunction. The bad news is these numbers are likely to get worse unless we can considerably improve mental health care. Why is that? Because the way the world is changing, risk factors that are well known for mental illness are increasing. I'll just mention two, which are linked to sort of the evolution of the population. Migration and urbanicity. Being a migrant is a considerable risk factor for mental illness. Migrants can have up to 10 times greater risk of developing a mental illness than a local population. And migration, it's a complex issue, is increasing over time. More and more inhabitants in this world are migrants. 
They live in communities they do not originate in. Another is urbanicity. That's also a risk factor for mental illness. If you live in a city, you can be two times more likely to develop mental illness than if you live rurally. Right now, about one in two world inhabitants are urban. In 2050, that would be two and three. So, what to do? What is the future going to hold to help us against these numbers? Before giving my take on it, I would like to reference this very, very uh, complete and somewhat technical article that uh, an esteemed group of uh, colleagues did in the Lancet of Psychiatry in 2017, where they pretty much went into everything. Future perspectives and treatments, mental health law, how to exploit digital technology, the future of training with psychiatrists. Uh, my take is a lot more modest. I just wanted to focus on two aspects mental health care systems, how we organize mental health care and where I think we should be going, and some thoughts on the relationship between psychiatry and society. Mental health care systems, I'm going to use the World Health Organization pyramid model, sorry to get a little bit technical, which is just a way of illustrating the organization of health care, in this case mental health care. In this illustration, the pyramid represents the various types of care, in this case mental health care. Towards the bottom of the pyramid is frequently used health care options, which are usually more effective for less severe mental illness uh, and most frequently used. The further up the pyramid you go, the more specific the treatment gets, the more effective, the less often it's needed and the more it will cost. This is the historical illustration and is sometimes the case in many areas of the world still now. The lowest level is self-care. That was mentioned in the previous talk. What do you do just to take care of yourself? Mental hygiene, understanding when you're in difficulty, and for less severe mental illness, sometimes that can be enough. For some people, that's the only option. The next level is community care, where it can be many people in your community who can give you extra help. It can be community workers, social workers, family, friends, spiritual leaders, uh, as many things that are not professional mental health healthcare workers. In this historic uh, system, actual psychiatric care, mental health care by professionals, is relegated to the psychiatric hospitals. If you have a severe mental illness, you go to a psychiatric hospital where the resources are focused. Where we hope to be going is something more nuanced, like this. Similar, but with important differences. Self-care and community care are still at the base. It's a good way to, to enter in it for a low level. Hopefully more informed self-care, more trained community care, uh, where there is more information, more understanding of mental illness. And this is where psychiatry comes in at one point, and a psychiatrist, is to help disseminate information and understanding also for these levels of care. The psychiatric hospital, hopefully, will be less necessary will be reserved for only the very most severe situations for short periods of time in favor of healthcare models, mental health care, integrating other aspects, integrating general health care, integrating the communities to be available in communities, integrating in mobile ways, which means that the mental health care goes to the patient and doesn't wait for the patient to come to the health care system. Uh, all of this organized around the concept of flexibility, adapting to the needs of the patient rather than expecting the patient to adapt his needs to the system. I mentioned integration quite a bit. That's another aspect of the hopes in this system is that it's well intermeshed. There's communication, information flow, knowledge flow, which will help the efficiency of the whole system and also help patients, depending on their needs, to navigate through these different healthcare options depending on what is necessary. Finally, just some thoughts on um, psychiatry and society. Um, from the perspective of a psychiatrist, um, often as psychiatrists, we feel expectations from society, which can be organized or categorized onto somewhat contradictory poles. And these expectations often reflect an underlying understanding of what mental illness is. 
It's a simplification, but uh, it orients a lot of how we relate to society uh, and families uh, of patients. One of these poles is control and safety. That psychiatry keeps society safe. Mental illness is a source of danger and problems, and you commit people to mental health care so that they are less of a problem and less dangerous. This is the historically grounded expectation. The other pole is quite different. It's focused on rights and autonomy. The patient is an individual with rights, rights to treatment, rights to self-determination, rights to a place in society, which probably doesn't have that much to do with the other pole. I would like to think that we are moving to the left of this over time. There is a debate in the world of psychiatry, how far the left is to move. Some think we require balance. Some think that we should work pretty much to the left. And that these expectations are better relative to other aspects of society, like the judicial or penal systems. And psychiatry should focus on treatment in a way that respects the autonomy of the patient. Finally, one last remark. I guess it's kind of simple, maybe obvious. Um, but better societies will have better mental health. I talked about risk factors. Many characteristics of suffering societies are clear risk factors for mental health. Poverty, crime, poor access to health care, poor access to jobs, poor access to education. All of these are clear and definitive risks for mental illness. If society can focus on bettering these aspects, there will definitely be less mental illness and mental health care resources and focus on the most vulnerable we truly need it. So getting back to David. Um, unfortunately, it's still be in contact with him. He's most recent contact, he was doing better. Uh, he's a very brave young man, uh, courageously struggling with his mental illness, and that might continue for a while, but I wish him the best for his future. I also wish that in the future, the mental health care will improve the point where people like David will have better chances, where a mental health care system will be more adapted to their needs and allow them to get better health care sooner and more efficiently. And I also hope for a society where people like Dave will be better integrated, where they won't be seen as problems or dangers, but more as individuals who need help, have rights, and need to be accepted and integrated. Thank you.